Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com, and we're reading and discussing the book, The Foundations Under Attack, The Roots of Apostasy. Yesterday, I concluded in the epilogue of this book on, uh, uh, I believe it was uh, page 205, at the end of the program yesterday, I called for the firing of the ecumen- ecumenical leaders of the so-called evangelical churches, and I reinforced that statement today. I concluded in the first full paragraph on page 205 by reading this. Listen to what it says here. When Cardinal John Henry Newman had met with Cardinal Wiseman at the Vatican in 1833, he asked him on what terms the Church of England would be received back into the Roman Catholic Church. And here's Wiseman's reply. By swallowing Trent whole. That's how the Church of England is going to be received back into the Roman Catholic Church by swallowing Trent whole. Now that characterizes the Vatican's assault on Protestantism today. Protestants are being pressured by their own pastors to regard Roman Catholics as equal in Christianity, as equal Christians, as Christians. No such thing. Absolutely no such thing. The members of the Church of Antichrist don't share the same yoke as those who have put on the yoke of Christ. It's not Christianity by any means. And there should have, we should have no fellowship with the Roman Catholic Church. No ecumenical movement. No peace but only controversy, as does Christ have with Antichrist. I reinforce my statement that I ended with the program yesterday. Every ecumenical pastor in this, in this country that views Roman Catholicism as Christianity needs to be fired and replaced with a Bible-believing, God-fearing, Protestant pastor. And if we don't heed this warning, Protestant churches of this country, the once Protestant churches of this country, the evangelical churches of this country will be overtaken by the Church of Rome. This, this, he said, uh, by swallowing Trent whole, the author says this has now been accomplished on behalf of the Anglican Communion. Only the issue of women's ordination stands in the way of complete merger, or rather the takeover by the Roman Catholic Church. That's the only thing that stands in the way of the full takeover of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, the Anglican Church by the Roman Catholic Church. And... uh, as with any unconditional surrender, there can be no conditions such as women's ordination. Rome is taking over. Now he says, whether such an outcome, such success for the counter-reformation was envisaged or was foreviewed or understood by those who determined the agenda at the Council of Kiel is not known. But most of the facts and solemn warnings that I have referred to must have been well known to the evangelical leadership. So the the implication is clear that this ecumenical movement to reunite with the Church of Rome is fully known by the evangelical leadership not only of England but of the United States of America. The evangelical leadership of the churches in this country are knowingly capitulating their churches and their parishioners back to the Roman Catholic Church. 
your pastor, whether he is admitting it or not, is secretly waving the white flag to the Vatican. And I think it's high time that the membership of these churches know full well that the man behind the pulpit of their churches is a traitor to Christ. I call on the membership of the churches in this country not to be lemmings led over the cliff to the Roman Catholic Church. I call for an uprising within the congregations of the Protestant churches of this country to stop this ecumenical movement before it's too late. The momentum that Rome has gained in the churches in this country through the ecumenical movement started by the Council of Trent, culminating in Vatican Council II, has created a religio-political colossus in this country that controls both houses of Congress, both political parties. And we're not talking about just doctrinal issues now. We're talking about the government of the United States has become ecumenical. The government of our country now does the bidding of the Roman Catholic Church, does the bidding of the papacy, the Roman Catholic hierarchy. The wars that, and skirmishes that we fight in the world are designed to benefit most the papacy. This is just how much control we've lost because of the ecumenical movement, the capitulation to Rome. Rome now takes it for granted that this is a Catholic country now. The Protestant reformers were wrong. The Protestant Reformation was the greatest assault against the legitimate throne of God on the earth, that is the papacy. And that this government now must serve the Pope and make reparations to the papacy to restore everything that was lost at the time of the Protestant Reformation. And then, and we see that in the formation of the European Union, and after that, the conquering of the rest of the world for the papacy. And the United States of America has literally become the battle axe for the papacy. Now, this is how far it's already come, because we have not recognized that behind our pulpits stand Benedict Arnold's ecumenical evangelical bellies who have forsaken the gospel and have turned to idolatry. We're seeing the same apostasy in the United States today among God's people as the Bible relays to us of the apostasy of Israel. They've gone a-whoring after another god. They believed in another gospel, one not preached by Paul. The consequences of remaining silent are incalculable. Incalculable. If you, if you can already comprehend that the military and economic and foreign relations and domestic policy of this country are fashioned to support this ecumenical movement to Rome, then you have a glimpse of where this is going to end. We've seen enough. The, the, overtake, the overtaking of this once Protestant land wholly and completely by the Roman Catholic Church, and it could never have been, it never could have been accomplished but without the help of the Protestant pastors in this country. It never could have happened without the cooperation of the Protestant and evangelical pastors of this country. 
And if we don't stop it now, it's going all the way. The United States is no longer sovereign. Its people no longer determine either the domestic or the foreign policy of this country. Papists do. All of the sovereignty, if there could be anything called sovereignty of the United States of America, will be vested in the papacy. It gets whatever sovereignty it gets, but it gets it from the Pope. Whatever rights are enjoyed in this country can be taken away at the whim of the Pope. The complete overtaking of this country by the Church of Rome. And as I walk up and down the streets of my local community, most people just think Catholics are just Christians. They've been working steadily for the overthrow of this country from nearly the very beginning. And our Protestant pastors have failed to awaken us to the, to the alarm. They have failed to sound the alarm. And they've cooperated with the Roman takeover of this country. You've got to know that if your if your if your priester in your so-called Protestant church is not denouncing the Church of Rome and is not heralding us a, a, a warning from the pulpit about what will happen if if Rome takes control, then he's one of them. He's afraid of offending his congregation. He's a friend that he's afraid of sounding intolerant and unloving. He's a hireling. He gets paid by keeping people passive, by keeping people satisfied, by fulfilling a need without telling you what the real need is. He doesn't feed the sheep anymore. He feeds off of the sheep. Complete takeover by the Church of Rome. That's what's going to happen. And he says, whether such an outcome... Such success for the Counter-Reformation was envisaged by those determined, who determined the agenda at Kiel is not known. But most of the facts and solemn warnings that I have referred to must have been well known to the evangelical leadership. But at Kiel, warnings of this kind were brushed aside by Dr. John Stott, who chaired the conference, he and the other leaders were set on accommodation with the Anglico of uh, the Anglo Catholics. Okay? They want to get together with their so called brethren Catholics. And it says earlier in nineteen sixty three a skirmish had been fought by these progressives with those who held fast to separation from doctrinal compromise. Okay, there were sticks in the mud. But what about the Bible? What does the Bible say? Who is spoken of in Revelation chapter 17? Is it not the Roman Catholic Church to which you wish to drag us into some ecumenical unity? This is the church of Satan. This is the synagogue of Satan. It's headed up by the man of sin. What is this ecumenical movement you're talking about to unite us with the church of Rome? On any endeavor... See, that doesn't sound very loving or tolerant, does it? So they label truth-tellers divisive, controversial, radical, when they're just telling the truth. He says, earlier in 1963, a skirmish had been fought by these progressives with those who held fast to separation 
from doctrinal compromise. You see, if you unite with the Roman Catholic Church, you have to compromise on doctrine. Rome doesn't uphold biblical doctrine. It upholds papal doctrine. And they are diametrically opposed. So in order to have ecumenical unity with the Roman Catholic Church, you have to throw out your Bible. That's controversial. That stands in the way of peace and progress. That stands in the way of unity with the Roman Catholic Church. The Bible is what brought about the Protestant Reformation in the first place. To have this peace and unity with quote-unquote all Christians... You have to throw out the Bible. You have to at least throw out the doctrines of the Bible. You particularly have to throw out the book of Daniel, the book of Second Thessalonians, and the book of Revelation. You have to throw out the book of Romans chapter 13. He says, Anglo-Catholic ritualists succeeded in a court action to make mass vestments and stone altars lawful. They went to some ecclesiastical court and made the fancy garb that is worn by the Roman Catholic priests who are sacrificing Christ afresh on the altars of the Roman Catholic Church. They wear a special vestment. They wear a a special clothing for that event, for that sacrifice, they call it. And these same vestments are now approved by an ecclesiastical court and the restoration also of stone altars. Altars made of hewn stone against God's law if there were even a sacrifice to be made. It's Jesus who made the sacrifice 2,000 years ago. Any other sacrament is simply a testimony that you reject the one Jesus made. Much less to do it on a hewn stone altar in these pseudo-Catholic churches. He says, as a result of this, many Reformed evangelicals departed the Church of England at that time. And why wouldn't they have departed the Church of England? It had become Roman Catholic. It had replaced the pulpit with a stone altar upon which to sacrifice Christ afresh. And it had replaced the normal attire of the pastor with the sacrificial vestments of a Roman Catholic priest. The Church of England has become Catholic. Catholic in doctrine. And they threw out biblical doctrine. He says their loss made the task of those who were set on accommodating the Anglo-Catholics at Kiel that much easier. That's what Rome wants. She wants us, a stick-in-the-mud Protestants, to leave the Protestant churches to make it just that much easier to conquer the Protestant churches. But our Bible says we are to set ourselves apart. We follow Christ wherever He goes. And if our Protestant churches have kicked out Christ and kicked out the Bible then we are to go with Christ and the Bible wherever He leads us. We already have the peace and the unity that the ecumenical evangelical bellies are seeking. Because they're not seeking the peace and unity of Christ, they're seeking the peace and unity of Antichrist. Literally, what we're seeing before our very eyes is the separation of the wheat and the chaff. It's nearly, it's nearly the harvest time. The evidence is becoming overwhelming. Those who we once thought were Christians are not Christians at all. They're turning black, just like tares do when they mature, when they near the harvest time. 
they're quite evident that they're not wheat. This ecumenical movement is proof that the judgment of God, the return of Christ is imminent because we can now see that we've sat alongside in the pews people who were destined to turn to the Antichrist Church of Rome when we thought they were followers of Christ. And guess what? God is going to root them out and burn them. That's what the Bible says. There'll be no rapture. He's going to root out the wicked. The tares. He's going to root them out and burn them before he gathers the wheat into his barn. That's the Scripture. The Scripture that they reject. Now who was this John Stott who led this, this conference? John Stott warned the assembly at Kiel that evangelicals, that is Bible believers had, quote, acquired a reputation for narrow partnership and obstructionism and that they needed to repent and change. The initial task for divided Christians is dialogue at all levels and across all barriers, he said. We desire to enter this ecumenical dialogue fully. We recognize that all who, quote, confess the Lord Jesus Christ as God and Savior according to the Scriptures and therefore seek to fulfill together their common calling to the glory of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, that is, according to the World Council of Churches basis, have a right to be treated as Christians, and it is on this basis that we wish to talk to them, unquote. Now, what are they forgetting? What are they forgetting in this statement? They're forgetting this, that Satan is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, his ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness. This is the final battleground right inside the churches. The fight with Rome now is not exterior to the churches. It's right in the sanctuary. Satan is transformed into an angel of light and his ministers are transformed into the ministers of righteousness. In other words, into the ministers of Christ. They look like Christians, but they're not. They're tares, and at the harvest time they turn black so you can distinguish them. And that's what we're seeing. So who are these ones who used to sit in the pulpit in, in the in the pews beside us who want to have dialogue with the Antichrist Church of Rome? They're nothing but tares. Tares among the wheat. And God is going to root them out and burn them. Should you be on the side of this ecumenical movement? Common sense dictates no. The scriptures emphatically dictate no. And I'm not going to be a part of it. And I don't want any of my listeners to be a part of it. I want my listeners in unison to condemn this ecumenical movement to return to Rome and do it loud and do it long and do it wherever you are, day or night. It's that important. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. We'll be back right after the break. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com Worldwide. Freedom is never free. We need your support today at FirstAmendmentRadio.com.
The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to support this program, please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors it. Now, we have the knowledge from Almighty God. Satan is transformed into an angel of light. Satan is transformed into an angel of righteousness, light, and wisdom. And therefore, his ministers, Satan's ministers, are transformed, transformed into the ministers of righteousness. They appear for all the world to be pastors of Christ. But they're Satan's ministers. And here's what one of them said. Here's what one of them said. Bible believers have acquired a reputation for narrow part partisanship and obstructionism, and they need to change and repent. The initial task for divided Christians is dialogue. At all levels and across all barriers, we desire to enter this ecumenical dialogue, I will add the words, with the Roman Catholic Church fully. We recognize that all who, who, quote, confess the Lord Jesus Christ as God and Savior according to the Scriptures and therefore seek to fulfill together their common calling in the glory of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, have a right to be treated as Christians, and it is on this basis that we wish to talk to them, unquote. Satan is transformed into an angel of light, therefore his ministers are transformed into the ministers of righteousness. And that's what they have to say. Ecumenical dialogue with the Roman Catholic Church. And it says, this statement made clear that the Kiel Conference 
was accepting not only of Anglo-Catholics and liberals as fellow Christians, but Roman Catholics too. Now the author says, let us just pause to consider the enormity of this. Thirty years ago, the Church of England's most widely respected evangelicals, headed by John Stott, determined that all Roman Catholics are saved. How can you determine that Roman Catholics are saved when they profess that they are saved by belonging to the Roman Catholic Church? And that they participate in the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church where grace is earned. And they participate daily in the sacrifice of the Mass, the crucifixion of Christ afresh every day in the Roman Catholic Church by a Roman Catholic pedophile priest wearing the vestments of a sacrificial priest making that sacrifice on hewn stone altars and doing it in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. How can John Stott or anyone else determine that all Roman Catholics are saved when they reject Christ by replacing him with a man? He says it's interesting to note that it was 27 years before leading evangelicals on the other side of the Atlantic did the same thing with evangelicals and Catholics together. In other words, evangelicals and Catholics together was simply a rehearsal of what took place at the Kiel Conference. Look, I reiterate what I said the other day. The surrender of Protestantism to the Roman Catholic Church is unconditional. The Kiel Conference didn't just determine quote-unquote Christian unity for Europe. There had to be an equivalent here in the United States, too. And we have its equivalent, evangelicals and Catholics together. Total capitulation, unconditional surrender to the Roman Catholic Church. It's a hostile takeover of America. Just as the Kiel Conference was a hostile takeover of Protestant England. Just like all these other commissions that were established, established Europe as a Roman Catholic empire. The very mirror image of what occurred in Europe prior to the Protestant Reformation. Total and complete surrender. Unconditional surrender. Rome's not going to be happy unless she has complete and total surrender from Protestants. And Protestants dare call the Roman Catholic Church a Christian church? The author continues, he says, the influence of Billy Graham and his new evangelicalism played its part at Keel. Graham's apparently hugely successful ministry had long since accepted Catholics and liberals as fellow Christians. His example, in Martin Lloyd-Jones' words, quote, of Christian fellowship without agreement in the truth of the gospel had shaken people's convictions as to what exactly it means to be an evangelical, unquote. This ecumenical movement has even brought confusion into the meaning of evangelicalism, Protestantism. What does it mean? You talk about confusion? You talk about delusion? It describes virtually all of Christendom today. He says the sea change in the evangelical attitude to it to ecumenism ratified at Kiel by the Anglicans greatly influenced the other denominations. Just like lemmings, you know, they're all influenced. They all have to follow somebody 
If they don't follow Christ, they have to follow somebody. So they let the example of Keel be the example that they were to follow. Unbelievable. To Dr. Martin, Martin Lloyd-Jones, probably the greatest preacher of the 20th century, led the opposition to the departure from Protestant evangelicalism that Keel represented. Martin Lloyd-Jones believed that far from providing the solution to the main problems of the church, Keel left the church with much bigger questions to answer. What is a Christian, for example? And what is a church? The abandoning of the stand of the reformers against counterfeit Christianity and the downgrade of doctrine implicit in Keel's statement meant, in fact, that true unity among evangelicals was no more. They disturbed the very foundations of evangelicalism to the point they don't know what a church is or what a Christian is or how do you define one. Of course, that's absolutely necessary to confuse the foundations if you're going to replace the foundation with a counterfeit, a diabolical counterfeit. You know, we ought to be ashamed, deep down spiritually ashamed for the condition of Protestantism today. We have no one but ourselves and our ecumenical evangelical belly pastors to blame. I count myself in this. I'm no different than anybody that's listening to me this morning. I hold as much responsibility for the degradation of moral doctrine, the degradation of the Bible, the degradation of the house of God than anyone else for not speaking out for not even investigating this for the first 50 years of my life. But it's time to remain silent no longer. Addressing the British Evangelical Council in 1969 and citing the scripture, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 8, quote, For if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for the battle? You know, my listeners, some of them accuse me of being egotistical, loud, yelling all the time. He seems to be angry all the time. What does the Bible say? For if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? I'm just simply blowing the trumpet as loudly and as longly as I possibly can. You can call it egotism if you want. You can call it a bad temper if you want. You can call it anger if you want. Or you can call it Christian fervor. Christian compassion. Sound the alarm. You know, if you disagree with the message of Inquisition Update, it's very easy to classify it as egotism, as a bad temper, as a bad bedside manner, as radicalism. You can, clarify, you can classify it any way you want, but if you agree with the message of Inquisition Update, all of a sudden it becomes compassion. All of a sudden, it becomes a very, very certain sound coming from the trumpet with an intent and purpose to raise God's people to battle. It's like Reveille in the morning. It's rude. It's loud. It's disruptive. But if you don't get your butt out of bed, you're going to get killed right in it. The Bible plainly says if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, in other words, if the trumpeter is not certain in his blowing of the trumpet and just toots on it a little bit, who's going to prepare themselves for the battle? You understand that in the barracks, after a short night's rest, after 30 miles of marching, the trumpet that blows is going to be rude, it's going to be loud, it's going to be shrill, and it's going to be disruptive, and it's not going to be very much welcomed, but if you don't get your butt out of bed, you're going to be in trouble. That's the certain sound from the trumpet. It's unequivocal, 
It's loud. It's disruptive. It's long. And you better get up. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones was that trumpet. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones made clear that he saw the enemy as not just present, but rampant in the camp. Do you realize how long ago that was? That Martin Lloyd-Jones saw the enemy in the barracks? Sound the alarm, he thundered. Sound the alarm. Would you, God, there were 10,000 Martin Lloyd-Jones today that opposing the new unity movement was a lonely task for him. Boy, can I relate to Martin Lloyd-Jones. I don't compare to him in any way, shape, or fashion. But I have lived and am living that loneliness that Martin Lloyd-Jones experienced. Opposing the new unity movement was a lonely task for Martin Lloyd-Jones. So many of those leaders who had previously shared his views were shifting their position. For example, according to Ian Murray, Dr. J.I. Packer, once so close to the, to, doctor, to the doctor, changed his view between 1963 and 1965. Can any of my listeners tell me what was going on during 63 and 65? Vatican Council II. That's when the Pope was laying down the gauntlet. Vatican Council II, when the ultimatum was given, you now believe in a future Antichrist, you've exonerated the papacy, now you've got to come home. You've got to swallow Trent whole. You've got to come back to the Vatican. You've got to come back to the man of sin, the of Rome, or else. Unconditional surrender. Well, J.I. Packer unconditionally surrendered. He once agreed with Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones on biblical doctrine, the atlas that carried upon its shoulders the whole world, biblical doctrine. You know what? After Vatican Council II, J.I. Packer regarded Vatican, uh, biblical doctrine as small print. Just small print. J.I. Packer, once so close to the doctor, changed his view between 1963 and 1965 to the very position that he had once criticized as inconsistent with evangelicalism. His endorsement of the Keel statement was telling, was a telling blow to Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones and others with whom J.I. Packer had previously allied himself. It was a telling blow, all right. You start regarding biblical doctrine as small print, you've let the cat out of the bag. You're a papist. You've gone the way of the ministers of righteousness, haven't you? You've gone the way of the tares. Because the tares outnumber the wheat by multitudes. J.I. Packer gave out to the majority. What does the Bible plainly say about the majority? Narrow is the gate that leads to righteousness, but broad is the gate that leads to everlasting destruction. J.I. Packer went through the wide gate because everybody else was going through it. And he sacrificed biblical doctrine in the process. He'd helped to destroy the King James Bible. He helped to destroy Protestantism. He helped to destroy biblical Christianity. Said it was a very few years before in 1961 that Jim Packard described the doctrine of justification by faith alone, sola fide, as, quote, like Atlas. It bears the world on its shoulders, the entire evangelical knowledge of saving grace, unquote. But his decision, his position on this defining doctrine changed as well, perhaps at that same time prior to Keel. His revised view has been recently demonstrated by his signing of Evangelicals and Catholics Together, the document that has rocked the American Christian evangelicalism. In other words, it, it has turned it on its head. Who's J.I. Packer? A papist. A tear among the wheat. The 1994 article, Why I Signed It, 
he refers to sola fide, that is, faith alone, as, quote-unquote, small print. He asked the question, quote, may evangelicals and Catholics together realistically claim, as in effect it does, that its evangelical and Catholic drafters agree on the gospel of salvation? Unquote. His answer, yes and no. No, Professor Packer said, with respect to the small print. Small print. That's what G.I. Yeah, Packer called solo fide. Faith alone. And of course, if he regards small print, faith alone is as small print, what does he think of Sola Gracia? What does he think of Sola Christos? What does he think of Sola Scriptura? Let me tell you, if he's joining the Roman Catholic Church, he has forsaken all five of the solas. One of which is Solo Deo Gloria. To God only be the glory. Thus, Sola Fide, a burning issue for the Protestant Reformation martyrs, and an issue which, quote, bears the world on its shoulders, is relegated by J.I. Packer as merely small print. I repeat, the Bible says, Satan is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, his ministers are transformed into the ministers of righteousness. It might just as well have named him and others like him, J.I. Packer. Tears among the wheat, they're everywhere. They outnumber the wheat massively. They lead the agenda of every nation. They lead the politics of every party. They're everywhere. God's people, the true wheat, are so vastly outnumbered that it is going to take the intervention of Christ himself to make it right in the world. And the Bible even tells us how he's going to do that. First, gather up the tares to be burned, and then gather up the wheat into my barn. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones felt that by compromising with ecumenism, evan uh, Anglican evangelicals were putting the, their denomination before the gospel and downgrading doctrine personal relationships and superficial unity, tolerance and love were performed to con confrontational truths of Scripture. Tolerance and love are preferred, rather, to the confrontational truths of the Scripture. Listen, <clears throat> nobody likes controversy, and especially not con uh, confrontation, but the Scripture leads us to controversy and confrontation. And history records all of that controversy and all of that confrontation. And those who died in that controversy and in those confrontations, and the Bible calls them the martyrs of Jesus, that with the righteous blood of Abel still cries to God from the ground, and why did they die? Why was their blood shed? By the tares? Because they stood for Christ alone. And they rejected the man of sin in Rome and called him what he is, the Antichrist of the Bible. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones felt that by compromising with ecumenism, Anglican evangelicals were putting their denomination before the gospel and downgrading doctrine. Personal relationships and superficial unity, tolerance and love were preferred to the confrontational truths of Scripture. 
He urged evangelicals to come out of the denominations united in the truth of God's word. How this was to be accomplished, he felt, was for others to determine, but he was convinced that it could happen and should happen. There had to be clarity. Rather than the confusion that was overtaking the understanding of the gospel, he said, we should not be asking, he said, how can we have a territorial church? How can we have unity and fellowship? Or how can we find a formula to satisfy opposing views? We should be asking, what is a Christian? What does one become? How does one become a Christian? And how can we get forgiveness of sin? And what is a church? Rock the very foundation. The conference at Kiel legitimized compromise for evangelicals within the established church, but at Nottingham, the second national evangelical Anglican conference, known as NEAC II, which followed ten years later, gave compromise its seal of approval. The ecumenical charismatic movement, which had begun in Britain in the early 1960s, had been opposed at Kiel by that conference's organizers, but at Nottingham, it was highly praised. The Nottingham statement declared, quote, We see a particular significance in the charismatic movement, especially in the strong witness of the primacy of God, unquote. And it was at Nottingham that leading charismatic David Watson, friend and mentor of John Wimber, spoke of the Reformation as, quote, one of the greatest tragedies that ever happened to the church. Did you know that the charismatic movement really stands for that statement? That the Protestant Reformation was the greatest assault against the vicar of Christ in Rome? I'll see you tomorrow. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthe